We've been spoilt with baddies. There's a sort of three-prong attack. Ferron, who's the king's half-brother, who's the governor of Paris. Paris is my city now. Grimaud's a gangster, really. Marshaud, who's the captain of the Red Guards. Ferron is a bastard. Grimaud is a bastard. And Marshaud is a bastard. Are you listening to me? Ferron wields a lot of power and is the one who's very much uh, got the king's ear. He gives the impression of somebody who is a, a nice balance of dutiful and uh, sort of wry sometimes. He's scheming behind the scenes, but he has his office in the Louvre as well. He's the dark side of the minister. He has his own agenda for Paris. Being in Paris does not make one a Parisian. Grimo is a sort of mobster character and actually has a lot of dealings with um, Ferron. Ferron and Grimo have various different goals. They basically want to put somebody else on the throne, be more in charge. They're using uh, Ferron's place in the court and his relationship with the king to try and, you know, make money, basically. The people of Paris have no bread. Desperation is always lucrative. <laughs> Ferron fills that political gap of, uh, you know, that, that the Cardinal had and Rochefort being at court, so he brings that political nature and teams up with Grimaud, which makes them very dangerous. Grimaud starts with a bang. Grimaud is this kind of slumlord and very, very dirty. Wouldn't think twice about killing you in an instant just for, you know, saying his name wrong. He's a very, very nasty piece of work. He almost comes across as the Grim Reaper. You'll see him dressed in black and black cloak in a battlefield. I think he puts the frighteners in Athos in a way that nobody else ever has. He's just a ruthless, power-hungry criminal. He wouldn't bat an eyelid at, at killing anybody. <laughs> There's almost a pleasure and, and an intrigue that Grimaud takes in, in taking somebody's life. There's no ceiling to where um, Grimaud thinks he can get to, and he'll do anything to to keep rising. He is a favorite of the king's. A very important man. Marshaux. <laughs> Marshaux um, is uh, Constance's biggest fan. You again. Whenever they come across each other, it's quite um, tense. Captain Marshaux, he is the, uh, effectively the leader of the Red Guard. Ferron, Rupert Everett's character's personal pit bull. Finish him! <laughs> he abuses his authority, he abuses his power, he's a bit of a sadist. It gives the Red Guard a bit of a Gestapo feel that he's in charge of them. And the Red Guard have sort of gone up a notch. I think they're a bit more intimidating. And I've always enjoyed that little thing between, you know, the Musketeers and the Red Guard. We certainly got a lot of uh, good moments um, in there. And then Gaston arrives, the king's uh, brother who had already been exiled for trying to overthrow and take the throne. It's not necessarily evil, it's more something, uh, you know, cunning going on there. The opening scenes where you meet him, he kind of dispatches three men. I've been robbed! And you kind of sense that he genuinely, he really doesn't care that he's done it. You know, he's kind of, he feels like, I'm the king's brother, I could do whatever I want. I definitely do want the throne. I make a pact with Ferron that isn't very fair to my brother. I need your help, Ferron, or I'm lost. I'm too centred on my own needs to think about him. Surely not the raising of an army. It is darker and on a deeper level than, than it ever has been. It's more insidious, it's harder to see where it's coming from. They do seem more dangerous. It really ramps up the sense of danger for the musketeers. They just pose a different type of threat, you know, and it's not always obvious. I think there's a, a real ruthlessness to the, to the villains this year, which has been explored, but not to this level over the past two seasons. 